Hello, welcome to the Classical Top 5. I'm Tommy Pearson and with me via Zoom are Fiona Maddox and Richard Bratby, as always. Now, just saying the name of our special guest should give away the subject of our Top 5 this week. He is, quite simply, one of the world's finest chorus directors and has absolutely been at the forefront of raising the level of choral singing everywhere through his work with the greatest conductors, orchestras and choirs. He's particularly known for his collaborations with Simon Rattle, going back to his time with the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, then across to Germany with the Berlin Phil, and now the London Symphony Orchestra and Chorus, where he's choral director. It is, of course, Simon Housie, and our top five is Works for Chorus and Orchestra. Simon, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. And I've decided to make a choice of pieces that uh, since the whole canon is so big, and since I'm so concerned that it should be a living and changing and growing canon, I've decided to go for pieces written in my lifetime, which gives me a very long uh, uh, <laughs> number of pieces, <laughs> and also pieces where I've known um, or worked with the composer. So, of course, it would have been so easy to do Messiah, Dream of Garantius, and so on, or I could so easily have done the pieces that I think are unjustly neglected, Paradis <laughs> and Perry of Schumann, Christ on the Mount of Olives of Beethoven. So I've decided to go for recent pieces and they've all turned out to be by either American or British composers, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't do a completely separate program <laughs> of German, Czech, French, Australian music, you name it. Well, the, the common thread of this programme is always that we choose them and then immediately go off and choose another 50 after that that we completely forgot to mention or um, should have mentioned. So uh, that's absolutely fine. And um, we, we'll go through them um, one by one, uh, Simon. And uh, let's, well, let's start with um, your first choice. Well, for me, the sort of defining moment of comparatively recent music is Benjamin Britten's War Equiem. Um, I sang in performances of it when I was a child. So that was in the 60s. It was only a few years after it was written. Mm. My dad was Benjamin Britten's uh, chorus master and my dad recorded all of Britten's secular music with Britten in the room. Um, and I used to spend the summers um, at the Old Borough Festival being looked after by the great soprano Jennifer Vivian's nanny because we weren't rich enough to have a nanny. Um, <laughs> and uh, so although I have, uh, uh, I can't say I knew Britain well, um, I was in that sort of world. And then at the very peculiar secondary school I went to, they did War Requiem in the 70s, only about 15 years after it was written, as a school concert without any extras brought in. And then it was extraordinarily, the first thing I did with the CBSO Chorus nearly 40 years ago with Simon Rattle, recording it, and even more oddly at Birmingham University, where I now am privileged to teach. And then the CBSO got the Britain year in 2013, and we did 15 performances of it all around the world with five different orchestras and four different conductors. Um, and I think it is really one of my very favourite pieces. It's, it's one of those, one of that rare breed, isn't it? It's a, a work from, from the last um, 60, 70 years or so that, that was a true hit. It sold a lot of records. There's that iconic black and white cover of the uh, first recording, isn't there? And of course, I suppose the occasion uh, are the, 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 of, the, of the premiere as well with the, uh, with the, the cathedral in, in Coventry. Um, and this extraordinary uh, balance of texts in, in the work as well. But it, it was a, a proper hit, isn't it? It's one of, one of the big contemporary music hits. It was, and it was trendy and smart and everyone needed to know it. And therefore, I do remember a time when people were a little bit snotty about it because it had been so successful. I think it's had time to settle down now. I would put it um, you know, in some sort of canon that went Messiah, Creation, Elijah, Garontius, War Equity. It would be in the sort of top five of all time for me. Um, and... Uh, 
the extraordinary thing about it was that when we did it, for example, with the CBSO in the early 80s, um, we found it difficult. The chorus found it really tricky and the orchestra was quite pushed by it as well. Rattle rehearsed it in very great detail and we had a real sense of achievement once we'd done it. We came back to it in 2013 and it seemed extraordinarily straightforward for everybody. <laughs> the chorus learned it in five or six rehearsals. The orchestra did one playthrough for, of it. It was under everyone's <laughs> fingers because of the extraordinary clarity of the writing. It's that thing that Britain so often does. Every instrument, it feels right under mm. the fingers of that instrument. The solo parts, the use of the poetry, so extraordinary. Um, the fact that it has three conductors but fits together without any temper tantrums. Um, that it's satisfying for everybody but pushes everybody just a little bit further. Um, it really is truly wonderful. And of course, it's the starting point for practically everything that came after it because unfortunately practically everything since it since it mixes the text of the requiem or the mass with poetry from whatever country you come from <laughs> there is hardly a piece that doesn't have a boys choir in the in the distance somewhere um it is one of the most seminal and important works and nobody has bettered it in my view it's interesting you're talking about um, the difficulties of the piece where, where, when you first did it. Richard, am I right in saying that in the, at the first performance, which the CBSO, of course, um, did the first performance. Everyone knows the recording, which has the LSO on it, but it was the CBSO that did the first performance, wasn't it, in commentary? Um, it, I think the, the performance, uh, it, some people weren't very happy with it quality-wise because it, it did present its own challenges. Well, I mean, I, I need hardly say this with Simon in the room, but um, I mean, Coventry Cathedral is a bloody awful space for live music and choral music. <laughs> I think it's a case that every time the CBSO and its courses have gone back there to sort of revisit the anniversary of the War Requiem, they've done it at exactly the opposite end of the cathedral from where it was premiered, because the space yeah. in which it was premiered is completely unworkable. Uh, you can see the photographs, there are lo lots and lots of photographs of those rehearsals, some fascinating ones, um, and they're just all crammed in amongst the choir stores, absolute mayhem. Um, I spoke to to, um, Stan Smith, um, who's sort of deputy leader of the CBSO for many years, he's 96 now. I spoke to him about his what he remembered of the premiere of the War Requiem, and he said, "Well, you know, he personally didn't much care for Britain, and he didn't much care for the way he treated the poetry. He thought poetry shouldn't be set to music; it was that good. But nonetheless, of course, as a pro, he they knuckled down and did the job. Um, he said that basically the um, orchestral parts had only been half copied when, by the time they got to the cathedral. They'd only had about half of the set of orchestral parts. Um, Britain was." all over the place, fretting, getting very, very touchy, snapping at people, being an absolute nightmare. There were workmen soaring away during the rehearsals, putting the finishing touches to the cathedral's fittings. Um, and yeah, basically, I think it's a fairly fraught experience. And Britain came off, he sort of lost his nerve during the process, decided he wasn't going to conduct the premiere, and was sort of persuaded instead to conduct the chamber orchestra, which was, I think, the Melos Ensemble. Um, and Meredith Davis, who's a CBSO sort of a assistant conductor at that point, um, stepped in and conducted the actual premiere. And apparently at the end, Britain was really quite shaken, was kind of came off stage with Meredith Davis and said, God, well, we got through it. You know, it was a good idea at the time. I wish I hadn't written it sort of thing. Um, and actually, um, you mentioned sort of the first, the first commercial recording, the LSO of um, the War Requiem. There is a, a recording has emerged and has been commercially released of that world premiere in Coventry Cathedral and it is firstly you know what an incredible historical document and what, what, yeah. what secondly it is not half bad um it's it's a blistering performance an enormous sense of atmosphere enormous sense of occasion there are moments of shakiness there are moments of strangeness it's, it really sounds like a masterpiece has been minted before your ears and I mean frankly you know I wouldn't have been too upset um with that but of course um I wasn't Benjamin Britain, I wasn't trying to try and conduct part of it. So. <laughs> Fiona, uh, it is such a key work, isn't it? I, I played in it as a student, I sung in it. Um, I think the last performance I went to, I went to the centenary Britain one at Coventry Cathedral, and then I went to one more recently at Liverpool Cathedral, at the Anglican Cathedral, and it was a really wonderful occasion. I, I was at both of those, yes. Yes, yes. I think the, the, the Liverpool one, particularly struck me because I believe and, and Richard will know this as a local boy um, I believe that Wilfred Owen came from very near and would have perhaps seen the foundations of the cathedral being built and that was just before 
his very early death in the Great War. Um, so I, it all seemed to resonate and, and it was a, a very attentive audience and a fantastic occasion. I, I urge people to go on iPlayer. There is the uh, there's a performance from the sixties, a couple of years I think after the premiere, from the Proms, uh, with Britain uh, conducting the the Chamber Orchestra and um, uh, I, I, I can't remember who's conducting the, the main orchestra, but it's a fabulous performance in black and white uh, with Piers P Peter Piers of course in the tenor role. Uh, that's fabulous, and also on Spotify you can find. Um, on the back of the original uh, of the first recording, you can hear rehearsal footage um, uh, where where they were rehearsing for that. Uh, uh, well, indeed, recording that that uh, famous recording, and uh, that's fascinating. Hearing um, Britain rehearsing the chorus and rehearsing the orchestra and going through all of those details—a really interesting insight that is, Simon. When I first came to the Midlands in 1980. Uh, my job was to be director of music at the University of Warwick and the University of Warwick Chorus, which is as a town and gown chorus of enormous proportions, 309 members as far as I remember. Um, very many of the older members who came from the city rather than the students had been in that first performance. And so, I mean, it was, this was only 18 years after it took place and, and several of the younger singers had been um, in the youth choir for it as well. Now, by now, we will be uh, losing those people, but uh, right at the beginning of my time in the Midlands, there we were with absolutely surrounded by the people who'd done that performance. And we're so lucky to have that document, because can you imagine if we had an equivalent of Gerontius Elijah, to name some of the great Birmingham pieces? And I would like to point out that because the CBSO more or less by default um, finished up playing the first performance, we add it to the list of the great uh, Birmingham oratorios, <laughs> even though Britain would rather have had the LSO, we think. <laughs> no, 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 quite right, quite right. Well, look, I mean, we could probably spend the whole programme talking about the war oratorium, but we've got lots to get through. Fiona, how did you find this subject? Uh, well, I, I decided on the, the Bible and Shakespeare level that I would have to take out I, I assumed that you meant a, 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 a sort of 19th century onward symphony orchestra or mm. late 18th century. So that ruled out uh, all the bark I would have put on. It ruled out Handel. And um, I wrote down Mrs. Solemnis and then I crossed it out only on the grounds that it had to fit into that same you have to have it category. <laughs> or maybe you don't have to have it. I do. Um, so I then went a bit, a bit more... Uh, not as um, off the beaten track as possibly Simon will have done, but things that are very distinctive in their own way. Um, I, aren't, they're not necessarily the greatest ever choral works, but they're works that speak to me, and most of them are 20th century. So I'm going to start with The Bells by Rachmaninoff, a, a right. secular work, um, it, one of his own favorite works. I have to say that for those who can't see, Richard is, has gone into a kind of ecstasy, I think, <laughs> with a lot of thumbs up. It's a setting uh, uh, in Russian. I think there's even a question mark as to whether Rachmaninoff knew that it was originally in English, a, a poem by Edgar Allan Poe, um, The Bells, looking at different kinds of bells as a sort of um, or metaphor for life, really, starting with the tinkling silver bell, the golden bell of the, the wedding, and then the darkening towards death. But it's a very, um, it's, it's a, a colorful, vivid, dark, darkening work with um, all the uh, rhapsody that Rachmaninoff brings to really everything he writes. But I think I'm going to pass to Richard to continue. I, I love Rachmaninoff anyway and I, th I think I'm not wrong in saying he he regarded this as one of his very favorite works one of his the works he loved um and, and sort of cherished most I think possibly because it was so neglected or relatively neglected compared to his piano music and um, his orchestral works I think um I think clearly he was a, he had a special relationship with the Russian choral tradition he was I know when he was trained at um when he was trained in Moscow, he um, actually attended classes in sort of traditional Russian Orthodox plain song chanting, the, the whole religious 
tradition and of course you know that manifests itself in, in his vespers but also cl clearly i mean he was he loved vocal writing he was an opera composer opera conductor for many years before the revolution um he said that charlie appin uh, was his great inspiration in the first decade of the 20th century the great russian bass and all of that pours out of his fabulously rich opulent uh, velvety and at the same time glittering sumptuous score um which is just charged charged with color and emotion it's everything you want from a great russian romantic choral work um, he also i just loved the sound of bells and i think he used to go with his grandmother to various churches um as, as a child in a quite troubled childhood and, and just listen to bells. We did it in the Kent Youth Orchestra many, many years ago in the 80s. And it's quite an unusual piece, I think, for youth orchestras to do. We'd never come across it before. And uh, it was conducted by Martin Handley, the uh, Radio 3 presenter also, uh, also conductor. That was a long time ago, but that was a real introduction to us for, of, a, of a piece that none of us would, I think, uh, ordinarily as teenagers have, have come across. Simon. Well, of course, there's a wonderful connection through the bells with War Requiem, which is d dominated by the C and the F-sharp bells. The Rachmaninoff I-2, this is not on my list today, but if my goodness, it would be on any list. Um, it's one of those things, if you're the choir trainer, you're quite glad of this piece. It's not very difficult compared to <laughs> an awful lot of the repertoire we have to do. The notes are relatively easy. The tessitura is relatively low. Um, Russian is, funnily enough, a relatively easy language to sing in. Nothing like as complex for first language English, English speakers as a particularly French um, and to a lesser extent German. Um, but it is one of those pieces that it's very difficult if you're not a Russian choir to find enough colour. What Fiona talked about, colour, taste, feel and so on. Um, what you don't want is a polite uh, uh, performance of it. And I usually finish up having to rather rescore it, which is something that chorus masters do. We constantly, from Beethoven 9 onwards, completely rewrite these pieces to make sure that we have enough voices on the main themes, that we have um, enough people to push out what the, the bits that need to come through. So it is absolutely splendid. And of course, um, uh, everybody aspires to do a great performance of the Vespers, and that is another thing altogether. But my goodness, the bells, I'll give that a tick any time. On, on my list, I have one, one piece that I actually discovered through a recording that Simon had something to do with, um, and that is uh, Szymanowski's Stabat Mater. And I, I don't really know very much about it. I love Szymanowski's music. I don't really know very much about the Stabat Mater, but my goodness, the sound it makes. And the, the final movement, which I guess is probably the best known uh, for good reason, is just so gorgeous and so beautifully rendered. And the, the chord sequences are so delicious. Um, can't really help but go along with it. And I, I loved discovering this piece. I think it was because I played in a performance of it at the Barbican. Again, had never heard it before and thought, wow, this is something went off immediately to discover, discover it. And, and Simon Rattle has done a lot of Szymanowski recordings, of course, very well known for it. And I, I think that recording, which is with the CBSO, Simon, uh, the CBSO chorus, um, I think it's, it's a stunner. Um, what are your memories of that recording, Simon? Um, that is one of my very favourite pieces and one of the great privileges of my life was to do basically the complete works of Szymanowski with Rattle. So we did the great opera, King Roger, we did the various symphonies where there are choirs, we did all sorts of peasant songs with orchestra and so on. An absolutely extraordinary journey. And again, as Fiona mentioned earlier, colour. It's like walking, it's like going on holiday into an entirely different culture um, and where the sort of religious overtones are recognisably Christian but nothing to do with the Church of England whatsoever. So it's the most fabulous journey and just like the Russian, the Polish text um, uh, again completely gives you the colour but the fascinating thing is when Simon started doing this in the 80s in Birmingham we used to do it in Latin um, and it was only later on that we thought we were being tremendously um, adventurous and finally doing it in uh, in the original language because I think Szymanowski had assumed everyone else would do it in Latin and it went from being a very exciting and very beautiful piece in Latin to something so strange 
strange and so it's so extraordinary in the original language and for that I'm so grateful. Well I, let's move on to your second choice Simon. My second choice um, is Michael Tippett's A Child of Our Time. Now, this is another very well-established masterpiece. Um, again, we seem to be talking endlessly about the CBSO, but one of the extraordinary <laughs> things at the CBSO was that we recorded this with Tippett. Um, and I was sent to see him as a very elderly man in his 90s in Wiltshire at his home. And I drove up and he was quite alone there. He opened the door and brought me in and we began work and at various points he would ask me if we wanted a cup of tea or uh, coffee and we'd go off to his kitchen and he knew the way even though he was more or less blind um, because obviously he'd lived there a long time and the thing that I remember and this is so important to the interpretation of this piece is that every time he went to the kitchen he would take a bag of potato crisps out of the cupboard open them have a few put them down and take me back to the piano to go on with our work and because his eyesight wasn't very good he couldn't find the packet of crisps again so the house was full of half eaten packets of crisps that had to be picked up by his amanuensis who came in every evening to help tidy up to prepare his um, uh, everything in the house and to cook for him um, and really this day is etched on my memory forever um, and it's one of those pieces that when because I spent a lot of my life in Germany um, and now in Spain and in Belgium and so on, um, there's always this question of which uh, British pieces of music travel well. Um, and The Child of Our Time is a piece that definitely travels well. Um, quite a lot of British music, people say, oh, they're quite, you know, they're quite ple pleasant about it. They say, oh, that was very interesting. And then they forget, don't want to do it again. Um, a Child of Our Time is one of those ones which everyone says, either, where has this piece been all our life? Or, um, you know, we do this regularly and it speaks very much to people all across the world. Do you think the, it's the inclusion of the spirituals famously in that piece that, that has something to do with that? Because they're, they're also, they, they're performed separately as well, aren't they, from, from this work? Yes, indeed. Like so obviously, obviously, obviously there's a popular element to it um, and everyone gets that they do the same thing that in St Matthew Passion that the chorales do. Um, also, the piece is of manageable length. It's relatively short. It tells an extremely direct story. Mm. He wrote the words himself. Later on in his career, his words become so strange that they become, I think, something that stops people wanting to put his later works on. Um, but it's still, the, the narrative is still terrific. It's still thoroughly manageable by everybody. And when I was a child, the, there were these two great pillars of British music, Tippett and Britain, always in that order. And there was <laughs> even a furniture removal firm called Tibbet and Britain. Um, and uh, one assumed that the two of them would remain after their deaths at the same level. And what is extraordinary is how there's hardly an opera house that doesn't do a Britain opera in a given season. But that until Tippett's um, fantastic uh, biography by Oliver Soden came out recently, mm. apart from a few works, Tippett had very much slipped in the second part of my working life. And I do think that's a shame. Fiona, Child of Our Time, it, it has to be Tippett's most accessible work, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, I love Tippett's music. I'm a, I'm a big fan and this is the work that I find most problematic. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't do it for me. I, I, I really try, I come back to it every few years <laughs> this time. And I, I think perhaps it's the time it was written and the com complexities of setting the spirituals that now it's hard to have a, an, a, an immediate direct response to without a lot of complicated thoughts. Um, I, I don't know, I just, I, I, I just would much prefer any of his other music to Child of Our Time. So <laughs> there we go. Very interesting. Yeah, I must, I must admit, it doesn't entirely do it for me either, but I, I do love, there are some, some of those uh, um, spirituals that, that they crop up, they're just there, and I, I love the way he scores them. I, yeah, I it's beautifully written. It's, it's not a question, it's more a question of the emotion of it is, doesn't quite speak to me somehow. Richard, Richard a choice from you. Handily enough, that, that leads me to a couple of pieces I, I wanted to mention. 
um, in particular, if I may, um, both of which sort of, I think, belong in the same tradition. They are much, much less well known and much, much less frequently performed. Um, um, the first comes from before um, both books, and it's um, Arthur Bliss's choral symphony, Morning Heroes, um, which he wrote, uh, I think, in about 1930, as a kind of war requiem, essentially, a kind of secular war requiem, setting texts about war by famous poets, apart from an um, large choral part, um, set of soloists, um, in many ways, very curiously prefiguring the War Requiem. Um, and it's, it's astonishingly, I, I heard it at the Three Choirs Festival a few years ago, and it's, it's, it's got all sorts of problems of balance and also and um, sort of scale and, and, and scoring and so on. But nonetheless, it, it just packs up an enormous punch. I mean, Bliss was, unlike Britain, um, he was himself in the First World War. He was, he was there um, on the Western Front. Uh, his brother, Ken, was killed on the Western Front, um, which is something he sort of saved him for the rest of his life. Um, uh, this sort of burning emotion, and this um, you can call this sort of great choral symphony um, as a tribute, I think, to his brother and to all, everyone he knew who'd lost their lives in the war. Um, and I just think uh, it, it, I, I wasn't sure about it on paper when I heard it in performance. Um, it carries an astonishing emotional punch and a sort of conviction. The sort of startling settings. There's a um, great choral. It begins with a great sort of um, melodrama, a, 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 um, an actor speaking um, lines about Achilles um, from the Odyssey, from, from the Iliad rather, um, about, about uh, not Achilles, about Hector preparing for battle. Um, there's a poem by Walt Whitman, um, astonishing, evoking sort of the, the artillery of the Western Front in which just, just percussion accompanies uh, accompanies the singers of a speaker, um, you know, this sort of distant thunder of trouble piece of imagination. I, I don't know if Britain knew it. I don't think many people knew it. I think there have only been about two recordings, but I, I think it's, you know, it, it's a really powerful work. Later, um, again, an, another work that comes after Britain's War Requiem, I think was very, very consciously in that same tradition and the tradition of the child of our time, which I, I would like to hear a lot more than we do here, is an oratorio by Michael Barclay uh, called Or Shall We Die, um, which he wrote in the early 80s uh, to a rather slightly occasionally sublime, often ridiculous text by Ian McEwan. It's essentially about the nuclear threat of the 1980s. It's about the Cold War. Um, so um, it, it sort of addresses the, the sort of the threat of nuclear apocalypse in the language of the English choral tradition. Um, I mean, Barclay's style has changed a lot since then. I think he's the first to admit it. It's, it's very romantic. Uh, these great soaring sort of, call, sort of visions of sort of starlit night skies, um, of sort of sense of dread sort of underlying things these kind of very strange chilly passages evoking the mechanisms of war um, and it's this heart of this sort of great emotional plea for peace and for beauty and for, for art and for all the things that make life worth living and it's it's a gorgeous piece um again i think it's only been recorded once um heather harper in the solo role absolutely gloriously uh, rapturous um and and i just find it fascinating it's, it's a real document of its time but at the same time it's tied into that tradition and there's something particularly powerful and poignant for me about the idea of that lush tradition that romantic tradition we associate with britain with vaughan williams even going back to Elgar, sort of confronting the sort of horrors of the Cold War and the reality of modernity. Always happy to have Michael Barclay included in any any discussion, and, and Lord Barclay, as he is, is right now uh, in the Lords um, supporting arts and uh, particularly the freelance uh, musicians who seem to be left out of everything in, to do with this lockdown and uh, support package from the government at the moment. So uh, uh, we should uh, say hello to Michael and thank him for that. Um, let's go to Fiona uh, for another choice from you. Um, well, I, I think we can continue a little bit on the theme that Rich has just raised. But going back a bit, I chose one piece that was before the 20th century. And it was really because I felt I couldn't leave him out. And it's Haydn's Park and Mesa, the um, mass in time of war. Um, I, I could have chosen the, the Nelson Mass, I could have chosen the creation, or that they begin to go into the Bible and Shakespeare category. But I, I don't think they're, uh, Simon may disagree, but I don't think they're performed as much as they used to be, the Haydn Masses. Perhaps choral societies do do them. Um, that's where I known them mainly through playing in orchestras with quite a choral societies and, and just loving the orchestration and the little symphonies that go on in the string writing and the, uh, the, the, the um, I, I, 
the just the joy of the choral writing that um, Haydn musters. It's it's not a, a work that has a particularly bellicose feel to it. Um, it it's 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 mostly in C major, and it's it's a rather cheery work on the whole, but it's a, a, just a great piece of choral writing, and I love it. Simon Haydn feature very much. Haydn, well. Uh, Haydn, uh, I deliberately didn't put down Haydn for the simple reason that I wouldn't know where to begin. Haydn is the person, the composer I would wish to have dinner with. Haydn is the person who, if I could only take one composer's music with me, it would either be Haydn or Bach. Um, the last six masses, the creation, the seasons, these are pieces I adore. I adore them for their, the fact that the extraordinary thing of these masses, they all manage to set the same text, as it were, of course they have to, in entirely different ways. Um, you read him saying, oh, I'm so old, I'm so tired, my eyesight is so bad, I have to write this wretched piece, I don't know how I shall ever finish it, and then doing it in a matter of days, ending it laus deo, um, and then you look at it and you think, how could anyone be so inventive? I mean, for example, the Nelson man, which celebrates the word et, and. So every time that he finishes a sec sec section, the choir goes et, and the orchestra goes on. So it's like dot, dot, dot. And everybody is laughing. Um, and God bless him. So much of the music that we do is so tricky and so, um, so pulling at our heartstrings. And to have someone who makes us laugh out loud as well, uh, and, to, uh, and the simplicity of a faith that believes so passionately. Um, oh, I love him above everybody. <laughs> You're certainly talking Richard's language here, um, and I'm going <laughs> to spoil his day by not coming to him immediately because we've got so many things to get through. Um, but I, I just talk about the joy of uh, of performance, the joy of music. I'm going to bring one in that actually got a real pasting a few weeks ago by none other than Mark Elder, who said that he if he would be perfectly happy if he never heard another performance of this piece, and that's Belshazzar's Feast by. William Walton, um, which I absolutely love. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't take the bait um, in that recording, particularly. I thought, you know, who am I to argue with, with Mark Elder? But I'm arguing with him now because I think it's a fabulous piece. Simon? Oh, I'm so glad I've never had the c courage to say I loathe it. <laughs> never, never, never want to do it again. It's half 34 minutes of unmitigated noise. I hate it. Um, I've, I've, uh, we did it. We did it at the proms with Rattle. It was splendid. We've recorded it. I've done endless performances of it. I simply cannot abide William Walton's music. He was a. a it's it's a, one of those things. I've never had the courage to say it. I quite. I think. The cello concerto and the viola concerto, I would make exceptions for. But, I, but as a child, I loathed the a cappella music. Um, I loathed the fact that at a very early point in his uh, output, um, he started simply recycling the same music time and time again. Um, my dad commissioned <laughs> some pieces from him. We've got extensive uh, uh, correspondence at home uh, with him. But, oh, never again. Oh, Thank Simon, you. Simon, 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 Simon. Well, look, I, I'm going to stick up for the, this piece. I mean, you say it's noise. I absolutely agree it's a big noise, but I love the noise it makes. I love his scoring. Um, I've never sung it because I'm a terrible singer, but I have played in it. It's a wonderful timpani part. But I, I just think it's, it's just joy in music. It, it's one of those great, exciting pieces. I mean, I would say... Um, the other piece that everybody in the business um, seems to nowadays loathe as well, uh, which is Carmina Burana. There's some wonderful moments in Carmina Burana. And, uh, you know, maybe as a whole piece, it doesn't particularly hang together. But my goodness, some of those moments are really fantastic. I, there's a recording that, that I adore of Belshazzar's Feast, which is Previn with the RPO on, on the uh, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra's own label. And the original recording of it, uh, the chorus uh, uh, in one of the big a cappella moments go completely out of tune so that when the orchestra comes crashing in um it it's 
it's awful <laughs> because um, it, it just it just doesn't work. However, you 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 go onto Spotify and listen to it. They they corrected it. They definitely corrected it because it's not as awful in the later versions. Um, it, uh, ben, Benjamin Luxon is the soloist in that one, and and it also, by the way, has some of the most outrageous horn playing. Or I've ever heard on recording. It's they are so loud and so fantastic. It's it's just a wonder to listen to. Um, so I think that that's my favourite recording of it. But so so, well, I I would come back and say that actually that's the reason, of course, that I so particularly dislike it. Those <laughs> very di those very difficult a cappella pieces are for someone who does my job and then hands it over to a famous orchestral conductor a complete nightmare. <laughs> um, uh, uh, because um, uh, and the worst thing of, of, of all is that if you get it completely right, which we did at the proms this summer, you end uh, uh, on a chord based on an E and the trombones come in on a semitone above on an F. And the only people in the hall who know that it's right are the conductor and the chorus master. And every single other person in the hall thinks that the choir is a semitone flat um, because the orchestra has arrived a semitone higher. Oh, no. I, Simon, <laughs> so I, you know what I love about this is that in the future, if there's ever a performance of Belshazzar's Feast and you're the chorus director, when you come on at the end, all I'm going to be thinking is that you're thinking, thank God that's over. <laughs> exactly. Um, Richard, you had your head in your hands during Simon's, uh, uh, oh, while he was getting it all off his chest there. <laughs> It's, it's just you know, the, the Walton phobias of it. So it's, it's been a lot of it around, hasn't there, the last few yes, weeks? It's, it has. Of, um, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I would not put it, it's not my absolute favourite composer. I, I thought the first symphony is a hell of a knockout of a piece. We gave it a very rough time to Mark Elder of the week. And I think Belshazzar <laughs> is a knockout of a piece. I've not ever had to sing it. I've never had to play in it. I just sit there and think it sounds fab. I love that sort of the brashness, the arrogance the sort of bravura which he just throws out these tunes. Um, I should also say I, I've recently been um, writing about his opera Troilus and Cressida and I mean it's sort of, I don't think anyone's going to say it's one of the great defining masterpieces of 20th century British opera but I think there's a lot more to it than people make out and um, um, I don't know, but the, the smaller lighter pieces, no one kind of, kind of did the throwaway stuff with as much zip, with as much verve, as much kind of um, cheesy, shameless tunefulness as Walton. I mean a man who could sort of tell it something like um, with Point or the Johannesburg Festival Overture or you know that 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 today he wrote um, in the fifties. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of a soft let's, spot. Let's, I let's not let's not talk about. Yeah, let's not let's not spend any yeah. time talking about Walton. I don't want to upset Simon. He's our special guest. Um, <laughs> so, Simon, another choice from you. Well, I'm going to actually take a link from the Walton because I have to say that. Um, the, the, every chorister's favourite piece is Belshazzar's Feast and when it goes down <laughs> every single member of the London Symphony Chorus was head over heels in love with it and I was the only person in the room who didn't like it. Um, the, there are two other pieces that choirs absolutely adore. I'm going to come on to one um, by Jonathan Dove that he's written an oratorio called There Was a Child. It's from 2009. Like all Jonathan's music, it's quite accessible, but very clever, um, and has had a lot of performances. But I do sort of believe that this should be absolutely central repertoire, rather than a piece that is done, you know, quite often. Um, now, this is going to sound terribly name-dropping, but I was lucky enough to conduct it with the Berlin Philharmonic last year um, in the Philharmonie. And we assemb assembled an international youth chorus of 400 um, as a part of an education project. And um, I stood up in front of the orchestra and I thought, I'm gonna get a hard time for this. And they absolutely loved it. They uniformly loved it. Players were coming to me with real smiles on their face saying, oh, this is tremendous. I'm having such a good time. What a terrific piece. Thank you for introducing it to us. Um, the choir, which was from Spain and Germany and England, marvelous. Now, um, the thing about Jonathan's music is that it is highly accessible, but on the other hand, he writes music that, um, like Britain, pushes you to the more or less the edge of your ability. So the, so the parts, the orchestral music is really quite tricky and requires quite a lot of rehearsal and keeps the orchestra very busy. The adult choir music um, is rhythmically extremely complex, 
it meant that it had a very tricky first performance in the Norfolk and Norwich Triennial Festival um, about 30 years ago, but they got away with it. Um, and the most fabulous writing for children who, um, where the music is really difficult, but they somehow, uh, it, he's just spoken directly to their souls. So I'm a huge fan of Jonathan. I've done many of his operas, but this piece in particular, I think should be central to the oratorio tradition. I think you brought up something very important here, um, Simon, that I was going to talk to you about, because I think one of the extraordinary things about your job uh, with choruses is that we, when you consider all these great masterpieces that we're talking about, they're almost exclusively performed, as far as the chorus is concerned, by amateurs, aren't they? Yes. The, orchestra, the orchestra will almost certainly be uh, prof professional in, in most circumstances, but the chorus won't be. Um, so that, I guess that means that some composers are better at it than others for, for amateur performance, even though it's obviously at the very highest level. Indeed. So composers who re in recent times have written extremely well for chorus, really understanding them, would also be James Macmillan, um, Roxana Panufnik, Jonathan Harvey. Um, these are pieces, um, uh, and Brett Dean. Um, uh, Julian Anderson. Now, the, what's splendid about all these people, Julian Anderson, for example, knew he didn't know how to write for a choir, so he joined the London Philharmonic Choir for a year, sang for a year everything that was thrown at him, and after a year said, I now feel qualified to write for choir. Um, <laughs> Harvey had been a cathedral chorister, Macmillan had grown up with church music, Roxana Panufnik um, as a practicing Catholic with her kids singing at Westminster Cathedral and so on, um, had a, a, a natural feel for it. But um, it's a fantastically important part of our music because you think how few professional orchestras and opera companies we have in this country compared, for example, to Germany. Um, and most of our music needs to happen with um, amateur forces. So something like uh, the CBSO as an orchestra, a chorus, a youth chorus, a children's chorus, a youth orchestra and a uh, community chorus and a related um, uh, contemporary music group. So that they claim quite rightly to be uh, over 500 musicians working within the city, of which only 82 are paid. Yeah. Um, and therefore, you have to, we need this tradition of music that is not impossibly difficult. So one of the things in my life, I've conducted the great professional choirs in the Netherlands and Germany, where we've done all sorts of Kurtag and Ligeti and Riem and so on. Um, and that's fine if you've got a great deal of rehearsal time. Everyone has a terrific um, personal um, confidence, something like perfect pitch and so on. And it's a great privilege to do that music and just occasionally you can manage that sort of repertoire with very dedicated amateur singers but uh, the, the world continues to need music that speaks very widely. Yeah uh, let's move on Fiona another choice from you. I've actually gone for something I don't know very well but was very struck on the one time I heard it in a recording um, and it's the St. John Passion by Sofia Gubaidulina. It's a very dark work. It's, it's very, very, um, well, it's, it's, she, she's a Soviet Russian composer who by then, by the turn of the millennium, had left to live in Germany. And it's one of a group of passions that was commissioned in Germany at that time. And it's, it lasts about 100 minutes and it's, a very terrifying piece. It's not an easy listen, but my goodness, it it makes the your hair stand on end. Literally, it's uh, it's also uses a that very deep Slavonic Russian bass sound, which um, offset by some f fascinating orchestral writing, really stands out as a very singular piece of music. Well, goodbye, Delina was one of those composers wasn't it that was sort of rediscovered I suppose um not really that long ago was it but uh, obviously she was in in old age by that point and and there aren't that many composers who get a resurgence of interest in their music when it, it, very late in life well she's still I think she's very um revered by 
fellow composers, younger composers, but possibly not wide enough known. And I don't think this is an easy work. I think it's something you'd probably have to listen to in a recording. So I think it'd be pretty difficult <laughs> to uh, sing, particularly in current circumstances, as it requires a very large orchestra. Yes. But um, I, I, just a, something to draw one's attention to, I think, here. Yes. Um, Richard, another choice from you? Well, um, when you gave us the criteria for this week, I, I decided I, I would go down an entirely secular route just to try and uh, narrow things down. And um, this is a piece by Carl Nielsen uh, called Springtime in Funen. Um, and it's a sort of cantata, um, which he was commissioned to write to the amateur musicians of his hometown, Odense, um, in Denmark, the island of Funen, one of the sort of various islands that make up the Danish archipelago. Basically, it's a sort of celebration of his working class childhood um, on this sort of semi-rural area of Denmark um, and it's raucous it's fresh it's sort of fun um, it sort of begins with this sort of lovely shimmering that could have been the almost like opening of his fifth symphony and then it just goes off in these all sorts of crazy di um, crazy directions it's um, um, I mean there's uh, sort of folk songs thrown in the sort of elements of gentility it's I mean it's rare that Nielsen really sort of engages with the folk music in a very obvious or kind of cliched way and he certainly doesn't do that here it's very raw it's unsentimental it's not trite it's very fresh it's often very funny and i mean it uses it's one of the few um there's some kids the sort of kids songs in the middle of the piece and they're just raucous they're, they're rude their attitude at one point they just burst out in mocking laughter at the adults um there's also this lovely evocation of sort of folk musicians of the period of, of the area, which Nielsen, Nielsen's own father was sort of folk fiddler leading a dance band. And um, it all has that rawness, that immediacy, that sort of lack of, I wouldn't say lack of polish, but that sort of um, lack of artifice uh, that makes Nielsen so life affirming. To me, it's, it's bracing, it's fresh, it kind of, it is, it's like a spring morning somewhere in the north of Europe, you know, a blue skies wind blowing in off the sea your senses tingle you feel it's good to be alive you're whistling a tune and it's all there and it's absolutely again typically for Nielsen completely quirky completely in a class of its own an indefinable sort of 20 minute choral work fascinating I, I'm gonna I mean there's so much Nielsen that I need to listen to this we you know there's there's the big works that that people know like the fourth symphony and the fifth symphony and all the rest of it but and a lot of the, a lot of those odd overtures but uh, there's so much there, isn't there, that, that needs to be needs to be rediscovered. Um, I, when I was thinking about about this, I mean, there's all those other big ones that I was going to put on my list, like Glagolitic Mass, Janacek, Bernstein, Chichester Psalms, which I adore, Mahler II, of course, um, Guru Leader. My goodness, um, there's a piece. Um, uh, unforgettably uh, for me, I, I queued up all day in the mid '80s to see the National Youth Orchestra at the Proms, conducted by Boulez. Uh, with Jesse Norman uh, as the as the as the um, what is it, is it the Wood Dove um, uh, part, and uh, because we, me and my mum, queued up all day, we were right at the front row. We were right under Jesse Norman's nostrils for the entire performance. What a place to be, um, and, and an extraordinary, extraordinary work. Um, but I actually I chosen uh, Ravel's Daphnis and Chloe as as an option because I think Simon the the use of the chorus in this is is, is different to a lot of the, the most of the pieces we're talking about here isn't it because it's it's more about color than it is about words and about text yes indeed and one of the fascinating things about being a chorus master for an orchestra is that a lot of the work one does is not the oratorios so there's an awful lot of training off stage voices or on stage voices in this case without text it's like a department of the orchestra yes um, and uh, it's an astonishing and glorious piece to be part of. Um, this is another case which is astonishingly difficult for the chorus um, because they have to sing in the middle a cappella and then the orchestra comes in on the same chord at the end of it. I finally, after about 30 years, got the hang of how to do this. Um, mm -hmm. And as a result, having spent so many years being frightened of the piece, um, one of the things I did recently was to found a master's course um, at Birmingham University for people to learn how to be the chorus master of an orchestra. Um, it, uh, and uh, because, you know, after all this time, having finally worked out how to do it, I thought perhaps I ought to tell people how to do it, um, <laughs> rather than just allowing everyone to fail for 20 years before they find <laughs> the key to the door. Yeah. 
Okay. So is the fact that the, the, that it's wordless the difficult thing as as much as as much as pitch and all the rest of it? Um, the wordlessness is difficult because it gives the acquire very little to hang on to. So in fact. I have, uh, along with many of my predecessors and with Simon Rattle's help, um, I have not put a text to it, but every different phrase I have a different colour to. So some of it's hummed, ooh, ah, you can, get, you can get all sorts of things by getting a good crescendo, by beginning on a hum, going through ooh, ah, at the top <laughs> of the crescendo. And the ooh is very often easier to tune and has a, a bigger focus than other vowels and so on. It all sounds terribly technical, but my <laughs> God, it is so difficult, but so rewarding. And what an ending. I mean, surely, I mean, I, I've only ever played the sweets, of, uh, really, but the, the ending of Sweet Two, uh, it, it's just one of the most glorious moments in music, isn't it? Everyone agree? Oh, yes. Surely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And yeah. of course, I love all the connections. So, you know, Ravel, it, it took me so long to, re to hear Ravel in Vaughan Williams, for example, the idea that Vaughan Williams studied with him. Mm. I just couldn't make head or tail of that 40 years ago. And the more Vaughan Williams I now hear, um, as Vaughan Williams uh, comes back to some extent in fashion and we do more and more of it, I begin to see that this time was most emphatically not wasted the year or two he spent <laughs> in Paris. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, Simon, we should crack on. We've got another two from you. So uh, number four. Number four. Um, well, we've been talking about, uh, of course, we're here because of the crisis at the moment. And as we come out of the crisis, we're going to need pieces that work with not too large an orchestra. And Judith Weir wrote me a piece in 1997 called Storm to texts by Shakespeare, and I would say also, following on from Richard and some of the things that Fiona said as well, one of the things is we need pieces that are secular, um, particularly at Birmingham University, which is an enormously multicultural university. Um, I, it's not much use if I only do settings of Ave Maria and then wonder why my choirs are all white and Christian. Um, so... Uh, we need we need secular texts. The Jonathan Dove piece I mentioned earlier is secular. This is secular, and my last piece is going to be secular too. Judith's piece is for nine instruments. It's three flutes, three cellos, and three percussionists playing the full kitchen sink. It's for youth chorus and women's chorus. It lasts twenty minutes. Um, it's the most fabulous, imaginative, delicate, perfumed score. Um, I'm so delighted she's master of the Queen's music. Um, she's someone who is very prominent, um, who we all know about. But my goodness, I would like to see this particular piece um, in the regular canon for universities, symphony orchestras. So many people have got a women's choir, but not enough men. This is the perfect piece to give the women and your local very good children's choir something to do. And you can afford to do it with only nine players. And yet it sounds like a full orchestra. Judith Weir, bless you. <laughs> Wonderful composer. Fiona, another choice from you. Um, I too had Glagolitic Mass as one that I found it difficult not to have on the list, but I've gone for something that comes from a, a similar region, and that's the Epic of Gilgamesh by Martinu. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's a strange piece. I, I've not heard it live more than perhaps once. Um, it has a narrator. It was originally done in English, but I to my ear, it sounds as though it should be in Czech and it has been often or more often, I think, recorded in Czech. Um, but Martinu's sound world, it, it seems to me to be like no one else's. And um, I, I don't know that much of his music, but when I do hear it, uh, particularly hearing um, the Greek passion at Top the North recently and hearing the choral writing there, just thinking, what is this extraordinary composer doing and how does he do it and is it the harmony is it the rhythm is it the, what, what is it that makes his his music so distinctive in that sense he's a little bit like Jan, Janacek that you you hear it and you can't really hear it as any, anything but that composer and that's it, it seems a terribly obvious thing to say but it really is remarkable with Martinu and the Epic of Gilgamesh is 
a, a part setting, and it's not the whole thing, of the Babylonian Assyrian uh, cuneiform tablets that told one of the earliest stories before Homer. Um, it, it's a, I won't tell the whole story now, but it's, it's full of emotion, it confronts death, it confronts sexuality, it confronts self-knowledge, and they knew then what, what we think we've only just discovered now, really. I, I think this is Martinu's first mention in our podcast, isn't it? Uh, how, how wonderful, actually, to finally get to him. Richard, you, you've got a smile on your face on this one. Yeah, I, was just thinking, I, I was just thinking of Martinu saying earlier about the need for works of small forces, the secular works, again, um, because um, I, I mean, Gilgamesh is on my must-listen-to list sometime. But there's one work of I do know, uh, which I was introduced to by Libor Peshek at the Liverpool Philharmonic many, many years ago, which I know is a particular favourite of his. And he, he wrote these little miniature cantatas um, for, I think, women's voices. There's one called The Legend of the Smoke from the Potato Fields. And it's an old Czech folk tale just evoking life in the Czech countryside. And it's the most exquisite thing. It has this sort of simultaneously folksy and at the same time oddly modern. It's kind of eerie and it's hauntingly beautiful. And uh, the scoring, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what it is. It's a very small ensemble, but I remember it includes ocarinas. Um, and the sound is, is just, again, only Martin who could do this, you know, he'd throw together things that shouldn't go together and make them kind of glow and float and evoke sort of a world beyond. And I, I, I love that about it. Talking of small forces, I wanted to throw in Les Nos uh, as one of the great works, just full stop, let alone uh, choral works. But of course, that's just, that's pianos and percussion. So it's not exactly orchestra. It is a bit of a cheat, um, but, a, but a wonderful work. Um, and also I received a threat earlier on Twitter that if we didn't mention Symphony of Psalms, yes. Uh, people, we, we, we'd have to be having a word with, with ourselves. I was but, assuming you'd put that in, so I didn't, Tommy. Yes, well, I, I was going to, but actually we did discuss it in the sacred works. Or the mass, or the requiem canticles, of or the course. cantata. Absolutely right, absolutely right. So we've done our job of mentioning it, at least, um, which is very, very important. But uh, no, actually, I, I didn't choose that one. And um, I put in Steve Reich's Desert Music, actually, is another one, which is uh, sort of going back to what we're talking about with, with, with Simon about um, texts and non-texts and so often with Reich um, using the consonant sounds uh, uh, and effects really um, and rhythmic effects with, with, with the voice as much as, as much as text as well. Um, I love the desert music. I, I, I love um, Reich's music generally but there's something about desert music I've really enjoyed. There's two versions. There's a smaller sort of chamber version which was done I think simply to acknowledge the fact that not everyone can afford to put on the full version. But I, I find it a deeply moving work, actually, beautifully orchestrated. I mean, it's pure Reich. It couldn't be anyone else. But I, I quite like that percussive a aspect of singing so often. You know, you, you get used to luxuriating in wonderful melodies and one, wonderfully written um, uh, choral uh, works. But sometimes I, I quite like that quality in, in the voice of, of being part, uh, an instrument, essentially, along with the orchestra in a slightly different way than, than we were talking about with Ravel. But I guess that's, that's another aspect of, of modern music, Simon, maybe that, that's, uh, that's tricky to, um, to get right with a chorus, that kind of writing. Well, that kind of writing, yes, normally uh, Lenos is done by professional choirs or extremely uh, good uh, chamber choirs, amateur chamber choirs, um, partly because you don't want to overwhelm the four pianos and the percussion with uh, you know, the London Symphony Chorus could number as many as 200 and the balance wouldn't be right. Yeah. Um, but the, it's certainly true that the, uh, that the rhythmic discipline required by all Stravinsky um, uh, is something that you really have to train in to all choirs. And therefore my last uh, choice is John Adams's Harmonium. Now this is a masterwork that has been performed all over the world constantly, written in 1981. I was lucky enough with the CPSO, with Rattle, to do only the, to do the British premiere and only the second performance of it. We were sent all sorts of warnings by Ada de Vart and the Sydney's, I'm sorry, excuse me, the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra about just how difficult it was and all sorts of advice from their chorus master. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it does push everyone to the limits because of its extraordinary simplicity and repetitiveness 
and that like in a curious way like Beethoven not written for voices um, but you have to overcome it and it does all sorts of very unkind things vocally in terms of testatura indeed John who has become a good friend says that um, he's slightly ashamed and sorry to have written it um, and would <laughs> like to he, he I did it at the proms two years ago with an amazing youth choir and he actually sent them a postcard to say he was extremely sorry but he was a young man at the time not not much older than they were and please could they see if they could find a way to do it um, and they were entirely entirely able to do it there's something about John Adams's music that is easy until you're 25 years old and becomes almost impossible thereafter <laughs> and this performance in the proms was particularly it was particularly good um, the, the reason I love it so much is that um, we did it, um, uh, the, the CBSO then took it to the proms um, after they'd done it in Birmingham. So I guess this was in about 1985 or something of that sort. And at the end, um, my job as the chorus master is to come onto the stage, get the choir up and take a bow. Um, but of course, in a great big premiere, um, who do you expect to see after the conductor has bowed? You expect to see the composer. And I'm about the same age as uh, Adams, more or less, and I also, I'm the same height, and we're both stupidly thin, and we both wear glasses, and we both have a similar haircut. And indeed, my mother's maiden name is Adams, and the Adams bit of the family went to America. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I passed on to the stage at the end of this, this proms performance um, and was uh, uh, met by this astonishing roar. And on the radio, you can hear, I still got the tape, it says, and here comes Simon Halsey, the tonight's chorus master. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> go completely crazy and I realized of course they thought I was John Adams it Wonderful. was the greatest moment of my life <laughs> <laughs> how brilliant <laughs> uh, we we're going to start wrapping up but we need to throw in some ones that we that we should mention or we we, we should have mentioned I, I mentioned Marla too very very briefly just there but we 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 do have to include it in in, in a list don't we I mean the chorus sit there for an hour or so doing nothing, listening to the orchestra. And then they come in with one of the all time great chorus entries in music. And it has to be absolutely perfect, but they've had no time to sit there and cough or clear their throats or get ready or anything. It's, a, it, it, it's such a famous work. I guess we forget that, there, that it presents some challenges. And I have always, always felt sorry for the chorus who have to sit there and do nothing for so long and then just come in perfect like that um but marla too has to be included doesn't it simon somewhere of course it does and uh, nobody complains waiting for that glorious moment <laughs> music 70 minutes um by the time you've learned it because it is very difficult by the time you've learned it um it does seem absolutely worth it um it's one of my main <laughs> teaching pieces because for a start um uh, if you look at it, if, if a student brought it to you um, uh, and showed you this as an example of uh, vocal writing, you would say, um, look, the music's lovely, but, but please don't do any of these things. This is, uh, <laughs> this is, the, 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 this is not wise. Um, but of course, if you'd asked me what my favourite top five pieces of all time were, then Marla too would be one of those. I simply made a list of people with composers who I had met, and unfortunately I missed Marla by some time. But have you ever thought that had Marla, because of course Marla died at 50, but had Marla lived to be 85 or whatever it is, he'd have been around quite recently. Yeah. Extraordinary to think that. Um, Fiona and Richard, any, any others just throw in just briefly that we, sh we should be mentioning? Fiona? Well, let's give a mention anyway, just because why not the Brahms German Requiem, because, mm -hmm. you know, I'd just like to mention it. Um, uh, <laughs> Penderecki's St. Luke Passion, I think, yes. is a very interesting piece. Yes. Um, and uh, Britain's Spring Symphony, I'm, I'm rather keen on. I, the settings of a lot of lovely English poetry with quirky choral writing, they'll, 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 that'll do for me. I've got a soft spot for Poulenc's Gloria as well. Um, Richard? Well, um, Lily Boulanger is sort of extraordinary, sort of fiery um, choral, choral settings, only a handful of them, they're punch far above their weight. Um, Berlioz's Damnation of Faust, so we've not mentioned Berlioz at all. No. What, what, a, what a 
hell of a hell of a piece at every level. Um, I mean, um, Sibelius's Calervo Symphony is a piece that's always intrigued me. Um, but I was going to finish really with um, some of the English tradition. I, mean, I, I never, I never did the chorus, the whole English choral tradition, the whole choral scholar, the whole church choir, the whole Anglican even song thing. I'm not one of those people who sits around trading my favourite uh, Nunc Dimittis settings over a glass of communion sherry with my various, you know, um, old, old old choir pals. Um, but when the first time I ever heard. Um, I heard the opening of Parry's Blessed Pair of Sirens. I thought, what a great piece of Elgar. Um, <laughs> I didn't realise it's Parry at that point. And um, the more I listened to that piece, I mean, it's, it's secular as well, so it fulfils my criteria. It's a setting of Milton. And the more I listened to it, every time I listened to it, that, that, those opening paragraphs, I mean, the whole of Elgar is almost distilled into this work by a composer who he massively, massively admired and respected. And then, I mean, the sort of the sweep of the thing, it's, it's I think, about 12 minutes of just perfect sort of vocal setting, per perfect word setting. Um, and Milton writes this colossally long opening sentence and this great sort of outpouring, this praise towards music and sort of, you know, and the heavens generally. And, and Parry just sets it in this sort of paragraph of music that's kind of so long, you don't always realise that you've been carried along on this great, massive, great time. Then you're about five minutes into it and finally arrives at this grand cadence and back to that magnificent opening again and um every time the hairs on the back of my neck just go back straight up on end um i mean i'm, I'm not going into back for everything perry ever wrote i mean i've had some bad experiences with judith lately um and worse experiences with his ode to music but i think i think blessed pair of sirens is just perfect and it's just thrilling and it's just um speaks to something deeply british to all of us i think thank you richard um what I normally do uh, at the beginning of each podcast, I ask our guests what they've been up to in lockdown. Um, but actually this week, uh, it, it seems that uh, we, we know at least something that you've been up to. Because Would you tell us a little bit about the uh, work you, you did with uh, Howard Goodall uh, and a piece um, reflecting the um, a tribute to the NHS workers who died because of COVID-19? Yes, indeed. So Howard and I have known each other since we were at primary school together. He's godfather to my children and we've been best mates since 1966. Um, uh, and I noticed on Twitter that uh, he was very early on in lockdown. He was mentioning some extraordinary work that one of his daughters had done and she works for the NHS. Um, and I uh, asked him if he would write a piece for the London Symphony Chorus in lockdown, a piece that we could do with a click track and uh, everyone on their telephone and so on. And he immediately came back with the idea of setting the names of the care workers and health workers who died. Um, this seemed an amazing idea and everyone got on board very quickly. Um, he, he has a great facility, he wrote it pretty quickly. And then we set about recording it with members of the LSO and the whole of the London Symphony Chorus, everyone at home, editing it, which is a massive job, as I'm sure you know. And all this time, we thought our idea was, we were very pleased with the idea. It's, uh, it, it's so simple, like all the best ideas. We were terribly worried that someone else was going to do it as well. Um, and it took so long to get permission from the NHS, through the NHS, that everybody whose name was mentioned, their families had been told and given the okay and so on. This took two months. Um, and it was finally premiered on Sunday. It's a beautiful piece, but what's best about it is that at eight minutes, it's only the beginning. Because of course, unfortunately, on the day we decided he had to start writing, um, uh, uh, 122 people have died. Well, it's now over 300. And he's going to go on adding to the piece until it's a complete memorial. Um, he says it's a sound memorial, rather like those memorials in the town square of every town in this country that list the names of those lost in battle. Um, it's been an absolutely humbling and extraordinary thing. Um, and I, of course, I very much hope that the piece won't be too terribly long by the time it's finished. Yeah, and people, so people can see that online, um, the, the various Twitter feeds, I think, Howard's and yours and uh, London Symphony Orchestra um, Twitter feeds have been uh, connecting to that. So uh, you can see that there. Simon, it's been such a pleasure to have you along uh, for this. And uh, as always with these, just a, a fantastic selection of music for us to go off and, and discover. Very, very briefly before we finish, um, choirs have, be, have, have really been... Uh, a bit of a focus when it comes to groups 
uh, capable of spreading the virus. Um, how do you see it um, panning out for, for choruses? Because there's a lot of, lot of cross people out there who are in choruses who, who feel that they're, they're kind of being picked on a bit. Yes. I think the important thing is that we mustn't sing together again until we're sure that the research shows us it's safe. Um, I think it's very important that people understand out there that there isn't a singer out there that is advocating doing something that isn't safe. No. We are simply asking that it should be researched for us, just as it should be for woodwind and brass players, uh, for actors and so on and so on and so on. Um, it's been a horrible time, but my goodness, it hasn't been a particularly horrible time for me compared to someone working in a care home or working on the front line in a, in a hospital. So what can we possibly uh, complain about? I suppose I would say that when we do get back to singing, a lot of people have their um, social life, even, dare one say it, their mental health through, uh, uh, through singing. And it's something that is done by a couple of million people in this country, um, which makes it one of the most widespread of all ways of bringing people together. Um, and therefore it's important. But I'm very glad that in the last week, finally, after all the lobbying, we have been heard. And now we must play our part when the research is ready. Well, let's hope that people can get together and sing very, very soon. Thank you so much for joining us, Simon. Absolutely fascinating. And thank you also to uh, Fiona and Richard, of course, as always. We're, the three of us will be back next week. Um, if you're listening to this on iTunes, please do rate us if you can. Highly, obviously, uh, because it does help us um, get noticed a little bit more. And we want as many people to listen to our podcast as possible. Of course we do. Um, and thank you all for, for your comments as well. Please do uh, um, comment and uh, ask questions, whatever you want, on our Facebook page. Um, just search for Classical Top 5. Uh, until next week, thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>